Hey, everybody. Welcome into our first episode of The Analyst's College Football Preview Show presented by Stats Perform. I'm your host, Mike Leon. In addition to hosting this new series here on our YouTube channel, I'm also the director of U.S. Media Products and Strategy at Stats Perform. Joining me to break down all of this weekend's game action, some season predictions, my buddy, data scientist, and formerly a research analyst. We're going to get into that in a second. This man does it all at Stats Perform, Evan Boyd. Evan, welcome to the show, my friend. Please, please, save your applause until the end. But uh, thanks. Good to be here, Mike. It is, it is. It's great to talk college football and sports with somebody who's been working on this stuff for forever. You were at ESPN Stats and Information once upon a time. I worked at ESPN as well on the college football front. We'll get into that later on. But uh, right away, let's get into the college football preview part of this. Um, last week was week zero. For those of you unfamiliar with the terminology, a couple of different games that happened. Nothing crazy. Obviously, Nebraska, again, blowing another big lead in the Scott Frost era. Uh, FSU and UNC winning some games against FCS foes. Uh, big matchups happening this week, which is truly week one. Evan, just real quick, high level, what were some things in week zero that kind of stood out to you? Well, first off, it was just so great to have college football back. Am I right? It's been way too long. And even if we had some of the teams that might not be uh, seen regularly on a national level be playing, it was still wonderful to see some of the highlights and some of the uh, excitement that we might see heading into this season. So I have to start with that Nebraska and Northwestern game all the way in Dublin. Um, and even though Nebraska did kind of blow it, they had an onside kick while up 11 and Northwestern came back. All in all, it was a really great game. And it really showcased how good the Big Ten might be, um, especially uh, possibly in the Big Ten West, where it's kind of a toss up right now between Wisconsin and a few other teams. So we'll see how that one goes in there. But, you know, I was watching everything from Western Kentucky to Austin P, um, from Vandy and Hawaii, which that game was a little bit discombobulated. You know, we saw a little bit of the talent of college football because uh, I believe uh, Hawaii had two fumbles and both of those Vandy returned for a touchdown. So, you know, we we're just get into the swing of things right now it's week zero and then you know week one we're still going to get some similar results um just like how we saw week zero you know i remember seeing that vandy score pop down and i'm like wow that is a lot of points on the vandy side it, it got out of hand fast yeah yeah that's the talent disparity between the sec and the group of five schools um well let's speaking of uh the power five conferences let's get into some top 25 matchups because there's some pretty good matchups that are happening this Saturday in the college football season. The first one I want to get to, I live in the state of Florida. This is happening about five and a half hours north of me up in Gainesville. The Utah Utes last year had a fantastic season winning the Pac-12. We all know that crazy game against Ohio State that they ended up losing 48-45. to Coach Winham's got a great squad lined up this year, and they're getting ready to head to Gainesville and play the Gators and Anthony Richardson and that squad. Uh, give me some of your thoughts high level here on a top 10 Utah squad coming into Florida in Gainesville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people didn't realize how good Utah was, um, but at the end of the season, they were fantastic. Um, from November to the conference championship game in December, Utah averaged 38.8 points and allowed just 13.2. And as you mentioned, they had that fantastic game uh, in their first Rose Bowl trip ever to Ohio State. They were playing excellent football before then, and that still was an even close uh, game. And the Utes are returning 17 starters, eight on offense, six on defense, and all three specialists. So they, I really think they're going to take their momentum from last season, even with a tough loss in the Rose Bowl, and really go into um, the Pac-12 strong. I think they're going to be favorites to win the Pac-12, and we might even see them back in the Rose Bowl, or even a playoff appearance. That might be very interesting. Uh, Tracer, uh, is kind uh, stats reform is just a uh, college football metric that's called team uh, rating based off of um, conference and their roster uh, really likes Utah. They have them at the 10th best team and a 41% chance of winning the conference. It would not surprise me to see them in the Rose Bowl game yet again, but um, I really like them over Florida in this matchup. Um, I still have some questions about Florida. Billy Napier really wants this game to be kind of the return of Florida football football and a win in front of a sellout crowd would really spice things up. Um, but I don't think they have the talent yet to knock off the Utes. The Utes are returning a lot. They have a really good secondary and I'm not sure how much Anthony Richardson can do against a veteran secondary 
But Napier has spoken highly of them, so we'll see. But even though this game will be played in Florida, I still like the Utes traveling all the way there and getting a win over an SEC team uh, in week one. You know, I'm with you on that front, uh, only because my sister went to Florida. Uh, so I will root for anybody that plays against the Gators. I'm just kidding, Gator fans. Uh, but I, you know, but in all seriousness, one thing you got to be able to do on the road is run the ball, right? And Tavion Thomas is coming back for the Utes. He's a fantastic running back if you saw a lot of – what happened last year with Cameron Rising and Tavion Thomas, Tom, excuse me, in that game against Ohio State. Uh, one stat I did want to give you, uh, courtesy of Pressbox Live here, Florida on, on the Florida front, right? Playing a game in the swamp. Uh, Florida's won four straight season openers coming into this year's game. Now, they have not played a big school from a Power Five conference, a big school. I'm talking like a top 10 team like Utah in a while. And then Florida owns the longest active season opening home win streak in the FBS, 32 since mm. 1990. So an interesting stat there as a top 10 team heads to the swamp on Saturday. We will be watching that matchup. One other matchup that we'll be watching, and a lot of people are Irish fans out there across uh, different, if you went to Notre Dame or if you just root for Notre Dame growing up, they take on the Buckeyes, a huge game between Notre Dame and Ohio State Saturday night. Uh, give me some of your impressions on the Fighting Irish and Notre Dame. Obviously, Brian Kelly has left to go to LSU now. So a new regime up uh, up in South Bend, Indiana. What are some of your early takeaways uh, about this game and things that people should be watching for? Yeah, I love this matchup. I've followed both teams really closely, being a Big Ten fan and having all my uncles go to Notre Dame, so I have them in my ear all the time. But this it really is the year of Marcus Freeman, right? He's never done a game like Ohio State before. They lost to Oklahoma State last year in the Fiesta Bowl, but that was a close game. It was uh, definitely something that, um, you know, he had a lot to deal with with Brian Kelly's team. Now he has his own team. So um, they're kind of depleted and starting new. They, Jack Cohn is gone. Uh, right now, Tyler Buckner's at the helm. But they really have a lot of good uh, talent there. Then we'll see if they are still healthy, though, because Jarrett Patterson might not be able to play. He's a preseason All-American on the offensive line. Avery Davis, their top receiver, he's gone yet again with yet another ACL tear. So that's a huge loss uh, for the wide receiver core. Um, they're really high on a guy named Tobias Merriweather, who's a freshman coming in out from the West Coast. Um, but he's a freshman. Now, maybe he'll be a surprise. We will just only time will tell. We'll have to see. You know, there's a little unfamiliar between Notre Dame and Ohio State. They've played only once uh, within the last 15 years, but not necessarily because Ohio State, whose questions, if any, last year were on defense, just hired a new defensive coordinator in uh, Jim Knowles. Sorry, excuse me, in Jim Knowles. And uh, where was he before? He was at Oklahoma State, who Notre Dame just played in the Fiesta Bowl. So there's a little bit of uh, confidence there. Maybe he'll be uh, using some tricks that he pulled up in the Fiesta Bowl, and maybe Notre Dame will be able to read that well. But despite how good Notre Dame is, being you know number five in the AP poll and being very good in stats reforms tracer, this is Ohio State. There's three teams this year that are giants. It's Ohio State, Georgia, and Alabama, and those three teams separate every from everyone else in the pack. They lost Garrett Wilson. They lost Chris Olave to the first round of the NFL draft. And yet they still have this incredibly good offense. Would not surprise me if CJ Stroud wins the Heisman this year. I think he's going to at least be a candidate. I also think that his number one wide receiver, Jackson Smith and Jigba, might also be a Heisman favorite candidate because he was actually better numer uh, numbers wise than Chris Olave or Garrett Wilson. So if we don't give it a Stroud, I could see the Heisman going for a wide receiver like they did um, with uh, Devontae Smith, excuse me, um, in if, as a Heisman candidate. Um, we'll, we'll see, though. Uh, it should be really interesting because they have a dynamic offense. The questions last year were defense. You know, the two losses they had, uh, Ohio State last year, were Oregon at home, as well as Michigan, of course. And Oregon and Michigan jammed the ball up the middle so much, and they kept the possession going. They both got over 200 rushing yards in that game against the Buckeyes. That might be what Notre Dame needs to do, just jam it up the middle, because we don't know what Ohio State might be able to offer. Now, I think it's a little bit too much, but hey, it's week one, so I think the Buckeyes will win, but I don't think they're going to win by 17.5 points, which is what we have uh, odds have them as favorites. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I was going to say uh, on the Ohio State front, you know, that loss last year, obviously, with Michigan, snow played a factor in that game. If you remember watching yeah. uh, that matchup uh, in, in week two, when they lost to Oregon, obviously, whether or not a factor. Uh, custom insights here. I wanted to give you on the Notre Dame front presented by Pressbox Live, our new tool that's being utilized 
by teams, leagues, and broadcasters. Go to statsperform.com to see how this tool can help you augment your game day coverage. Uh, the Irish have scored at least 28 points in eight consecutive games. This is according to our Custom Insights team from this report. The only longer streak that they've had in the past 40 years was a run of nine straight games with 28 plus points in 2005. And by the way, Notre Dame is 41 and one, speaking of rushing, when rushing for 100 plus yards since the start of the 28th season, 100 yards or more, 41 and one, every other FBS team has lost at least twice in that span when rushing for 100 yards or more. So testing how the Ohio State front seven will handle running the ball will be a huge key in this game. I'm with you too. The line's a little too high for that matchup. But, you know, at the shoe, you never know. Funny enough, we had Quincy Avery on, who's the quarterback trainer for a lot of NFL and college quarterbacks, CJ Stroud, amongst those he talked about on our Check the Stats program, how good he thinks CJ will be going forward, not only as a Buckeye, but to the NFL game. Uh, let's stay with uh, another SEC school we were talking about earlier. You mentioned Alabama and Georgia and how Ohio State is. Those are really the three big boys. Well, there's a huge matchup happening in the SEC against uh, a group of five school. Well, soon will be a power five school as Cincinnati's transitioning to the Big 12. Cincy and Arkansas in a matchup of ranked foes. Give me some of your takeaways. We all saw Cincinnati last year in the college football playoff. Obviously, their quarterback went on now to the Atlanta Falcons. They've lost some talent from that team. Uh, Arkansas getting ready to hopefully stake some ground in the SEC West here. Uh, give me some of your thoughts on that top 25 matchup. This matchup might be the most interesting all season, but definitely in week one. I see this as a team that was really on the high and is now coming and declining a little bit and versus a team that started low and is coming in really high. With Cincinnati, obviously they made the playoff last year, and I still think they are a really solid team, especially with an easy schedule in the American Athletic. But I don't see them beating an Arkansas team that is really on the rise. Cincinnati... You said it. No more Desmond Ritter. No more Sauce Gardner. No more Kobe Bryant. A huge blow to the offense and huge blows to the secondary. All five starters, though, on the offensive line that at least played in the Cotton Bowl are back this season. So that does give them a little hope. So perhaps maybe they can run the ball a little bit more. I'm not sure. We'll have to see. They have also a tight end duo, uh, Josh Weil and Leonard Taylor. Both of them are back. Desmond Ritter loved using those. Those two, um, and I'm not sure if you know we're going to see that again this season. Time will tell. They do have big names in smaller positions and you know lesser known names in bigger positions. So I don't think they'll be back in the playoff this year, but I do think they could be a 10-win team, especially with their uh, easy conference yet again. Tracer has them winning the American Athletic about 53% of the time out of 10,000 simulations. So strong chance that the Bearcats are going to at least be back in a, maybe even a New Year's Six Bowl. Um, they're going to be really good. But in terms of this matchup against Arkansas, this Arkansas team was really tough at the end of the year. And I'm really thinking that they can carry that momentum from last year into this season, especially for this first game at home against Cincinnati. They won five of its last six to end the season with that lone loss coming against Alabama. That was a really close game. If you didn't watch that game, Arkansas played Alabama really tough and only lost by a touchdown. So that could have been a huge game changer to the whole season had Arkansas ended up winning that game. And I think we would be talking about Arkansas's favorites to this game easily if they won that game. So I like them. I think they're good at pressuring QBs, and I think that's going to be a big uh, factor against Cincinnati. Defense is okay, but their pass defense can really uh, turn it up. And I think they will have the advantage at home against Cincinnati in this one. You know, one thing I wanted to follow up on that, uh, give some more context, Arkansas last year, and I'm with you, they got a lot of talent returning, but they led all power five teams last year with over 230 yards rushing per game last season. They bring back four of their starters on the offensive line. Tough for the Bearcats in week one uh, to play on the road there, but I do like the way their season and their schedule kind of uh, shapes up for them. And especially like you mentioned in the AAC a little bit of a down year for the AAC potentially this year. Not not that many teams that can compete with them. It, it wouldn't surprise me if they uh, go into bowl season as a one-loss team with that one loss coming against Arkansas. Right. I totally agree with that. Um, let's get into one more huge matchup. Speaking of the SEC, and you already touched on them before, but the Georgia Bulldogs. Okay. We know what they did last season. They are hosting the Oregon Ducks. In a huge matchup, Saturday at 3.30 Eastern time 
Uh, obviously, we know that uh, Coach Cristobal has left the Oregon Ducks. He went over to University of Miami, where I'm at. I am actually around. Um, I'm curious to get some of your takeaways. Obviously, the Ducks and Georgia both lost a lot of talent to the NFL last season, um, and you saw it play out within the first round of the NFL draft. So give me some of your impressions and what people should watch for this game. This might be two big names. I actually don't see this as a very exciting game because I think Georgia is going to be really, really good, and Oregon still has a lot of questions. Georgia as is actually the number one team in Tracer. I know a lot of people like Alabama, but we like Georgia with that fantastic defense coming into it. And a lot of the offense kind of remains the same. So um, they just have a little bit um, of a uh, tougher time maybe going in compared to all the recruits that Ohio State and Alabama got. But we really like Georgia. And something about Georgia is that they have a really easy schedule this year. They don't have to play Alabama. They really don't have to play that much. They don't have to play Kentucky. That might be a little bit of a challenge, but we have them with a 38% chance of winning out going into uh, the SEC championship game. So they could really have a, a really good chance of being undefeated going into the SEC championship game, which I think would be huge. So, and as well as a 58% chance of even winning the conference and a, a 92% chance of winning their division, in the SEC. So I think they're really talented. And I think they are one of those three teams that are going to be giants that are going to steamroll a lot of teams. Oregon still, I feel like has a lot of questions, not only in this game, but for the rest of the season, they have Bo Nix this year. And that's on everyone's minds. Recall that in his first career game, it was actually against the Ducks back in 2019. And he had a last minute touchdown to win it for the Tigers. So I think a lot of Ducks fans are going to remember that. But he does have trouble with the pressure. And now he's playing against a Georgia team that was the best defense last year. So I don't think that's going to match up really well. I think it's going to be tough. And I think Georgia kills in this game. Um, I don't think it's actually going to be that close. It is at a neutral site but it's in Atlanta. It's at Mercedes Benz. It's going to be a home game for Georgia. Right. I agree with you, Evan. Uh, you know, funny enough, I was reading predictions. There was a couple of publications, Sports Illustrated amongst them, that actually think the Ducks can hang out, hang around in this game and potentially win it. And I'm I'm just scratching my head. Maybe it's because of all the talent that they lost. The Bo Nix thing is a really good stat because obviously everyone knows what he did at Auburn and in the SEC as well. Um, so four matchups to watch, all of them featuring top 25 teams, two of them featuring Pac-12 teams that are going on the road. Technically, like, like Evan mentioned, neutral site game, but that's not really a neutral site game from Athens, Georgia to Atlanta. Um, so I want now for the people that are watching this, listening to this across the analysts or our YouTube channel, team to watch this season. You and I will both have a team from different conferences. Uh, you go first on your team to watch in the college football season this year. Well, Mike, this might be my first time doing this, but this is my uh, good chance to declare that I am a champion for the mid-majors, especially in college basketball, but in college football, especially I love it when a mid-major team is good, possibly on the rise, and can really make an impact uh, towards the college football landscape. And that for me this year is Fresno State. Um, they actually had a really solid year last year. I think kind of got um, swept under the rug a little bit. They had a 10-win season. Jeff Tedford is back at the helm. He returns to his alma mater for actually a second stint. And when we first arrived, he took a team that went 1-11 to in 2016 to a 10-4 team in 2017 and then a 12-2 team in 2018. He had to step down because of health issues, but now is back. And now he inherits a 10-3 team instead of a 1-11 team. So I think the cards are all there for Fresno State. Jake Hayner is back for his senior season. He was solid. Transferred from Washington, threw for over 4,000 yards last season with 33 touchdowns. He was just one of nine FBS players last year with to throw over 4,000 yards. And three of his top four receivers from last season are also back, including Jalen Cropper, whose 11 receiving TDs last season were tied for second in the conference. The path is a little bit more difficult, though. They have Oregon State uh, and then on the road to USC, which is going to be a tough game. But if they handle both of those games, I think we're going to be talking Fresno State as a top contender for the best mid-major team in the country. And I think they will uh, have a chance to win the Mountain West, even though the Mountain West is a bit tougher this season. Um, so we'll see how they go. Tracer doesn't love their chances for a 10-win season again, but they do have a 37% chance to win their division and about 20% chance to win the Mountain West. A few key wins could make them a surprise candidate, I would say, um, to maybe even make a New Year's Six Bowl. We'll see. And on the AP Bowl, 
but they did receive some votes. And so I think they will be one team to really watch for, um, especially in these early months um, going into the season. That's a pretty good pick. Interesting. Obviously, on the NFL front, I root for a team that has two Bulldogs uh, manning the the helm in, in Derek Carr and Devontae Adams. For the Raiders, for those of you knowing uh, my fandom, and so this is a pretty good pick there. I like the Fresno State Bulldogs. Jeff Tefford, obviously, formerly at Cal. Uh, and they've always had some pretty good coaches as well, Pat Hill and a bunch of other folks yeah. that have run that program. I am going to stay with a Power 5 school and one that's actually in the top 25 in NC State. Um, here's why I love NC State and what's happening in Raleigh. Uh, the first thing is I follow football recruiting. I'm a Jersey guy. I'm a Rutgers guy. Devin Leary's from the state of New Jersey, and I I know how good he has been. This is from our press box live tool and an insight from our research team. In 2021, Leary was just a third FBS quarterback in five years to have at least 35 touchdown passes and no more than five picks on the season. A lot of touchdowns, production, not turning the ball over. The only other two people that did that in college football, Justin Fields and Mac Jones. So he's in pretty good company right there. They know that they have somebody that can lead them down the, down the field and, and get a touchdown or get a score uh, as they're winding down the clock or or even kill the the clock, you know, get a big third down conversion to keep the possession. I love their schedule as well. Six The first six games of the season, they only leave the state once, and it's to go to South Carolina, to Clemson. So that matchup, which happens in week five, is going to be a huge one to watch. But they op- open up with Connecticut at home. They open up at East Carolina, excuse me, Charleston Southern, Texas Tech, and Connecticut at home. I think they'll go 4-0 in the non-conference slate. Another stat and insight that came from our team on their opening matchup is obviously I mentioned they, they play East Carolina. They have opened up every time they've played against an East Carolina team, they've beaten by at least 28 points in each of the last two meetings. So that bodes well for them to get off to a four and zero start. And I don't see an L on their record unless they fall victim to, you know, uh, Death Valley, which could be a night game there. But the rest of their schedule kind of breaks easy for them. And they have a bunch of opportunities with Wake Forest at home. Uh, they only play at Syracuse and then the final game of the season against their uh, rivals in North Carolina. I really look for them to potentially win their division. And they're going to get in the ACC championship game, maybe. Maybe not. Who knows? But this could be a very, very good team that's happening in Raleigh. So that's my team to watch this year uh, on the NC State Wolfpack. My thank yous to uh, to Evan Boyd, who is a data scientist here at Stats Perform. This guy knows everything, research and insights. You can check out his work on theanalyst.com. We'll be doing more of these college football look-ins uh, over the next couple of weeks and months as we wind down the college football season and get ready uh, well, wind down. We're starting it up and then we're going to wind it down and we'll see who's going to win the Heisman. We're going to have you make a Heisman prediction too in our next episode. Thank you for tuning in to this episode, everybody. You can check out all of the custom insights and how Pressbox Live can help augment your game day coverage if you just go to statsperform.com or if you want to read any of the work that Evan was talking about and the tracer model, you can check it out at theanalyst.com. So long for Evan and Mike. Take care.